good evening to all. Thank you for being here. And I am using Italy to speak directly to my students without reading a text. <laughs> I do a show. <laughs> but uh, uh, today I have to use English, so I have prepared a text and I, I will read the text. I hope it's not boring for you. <laughs> so, yeah. in this first lesson, I'd like to address how the memory of fascist anti-Semitism and the Italians' participation in the Shoah was developed and elaborated from the immediate post-war period through today. Uh, before starting, I think it is important to underline some key points which may not be familiar to everyone regarding the persecution of the Jews in Italy during the fascist era. The fascist decision to develop an anti-Semitic policy dates to 1937. The, the, uh, this is uh, 15 years after the fascist party's march on Rome that brought Benito Mussolini to power and can be included in the regime's racist turn after the conquest of Ethiopia in 1936 and the birth of the Italian Empire. In order to prevent race contamination, the fascist regime adopted legislative measures in 1937 regarding the indigenous population of the African colonies, for example, they prohibited stable relationships of a sexual nature between Italian citizens and the subjects of Italian East Africa, Africa Orientale Italiana, formed from Somaliland, Eritrea, and Ethiopia. In a short time, anti-Semitism was soon added to the regime's racist policies. We must remember that until the imperialistic and racist war in Ethiopia, Anti-Semitism had been contained to mild journalistic propaganda and trusted mainly to peripheral media outlets. A few journalists and fascist intellectuals disseminated this anti-Semitic rhetoric, such as Telesio Interlandi, editor of the daily Il Tevere, and Giovanni Preziosi, who in 19... 21 became the first to translate into Italian uh, the protocols of the elders of Sion, Protocoli de Savi Anziani di Sion, the famous libel which purported to outline Jewish plans to dominate the world. Anti Semitic positions also throve within the party establishment, supported by a radical exponent, Roberto Farinacci who was secretary of the National Fascist Party from February 1925 to March 1926, short period. They adopted typical anti-Semitic cliché, such as the connection between Judaism, Bolshevism, and Freemasonry, accusing the Jews of being anti-nationalistic, anti-patriotic, and the Zionist movement of being anti-fascist. Still, anti-Semitism, which in Italy didn't have as deep roots as in France or Germany, was never part of the official ideology of the regime. But between 1937 and uh, 1938, at Mussolini behest, an anti-Semitic campaign was launched involving all the Italian media and simultaneously government ministers conducted a secret accounting of the Jewish staff. The official embrace of the anti-Semitic stance was marked by the July 1938 publication of the so-called Manifesto of Race, Manifesto della Razza, you can see here, the title was the Fascismo e Problemi della Razza. It was published on the Il Giornale d'Italia on 14 July 1938. A document signed by 10 scientists, but in reality written by a young anthropologist, Guido Landra, following precise directions from Mussolini. The document maintained the existence of human races you can see the f point one, le razze umane esistono, human races does exist, do exist, 
define racial characteristics according to biological criteria. Uh, maybe third num uh, point number three, il concetto di razza è concetto puramente biologico, mm, pure, pure biological, uh, affirm the, existence, uh, affirm the existence of a pure Italian race of Aryan origin. Four, la popolazione dell'Italia attuale di origine ariana e la sua civiltà è ariana. Uh, I, th I think we, I, uh, I must not translate, you can understand very well. <laughs> you speak French, so... <laughs> um, insisted that the Jews were a separate race. I don't remember. Uh, gli ebrei non appartengono alla razza italiana. This one, point no, uh, nine. Nine, nine of Deutsch, okay. And that the purity of the Italian race should in no way be polluted. So the following month, in August 1938, a census carried out by Italian authorities and based on biological criteria classified 51,000 people as belonging to the Jewish race, including 9,800 foreigners. Taken as a whole, this was little more than one thousandth of the population. In August, also started the publication uh, of the weekly magazine La Difesa della Razza, the defense of the race, whom director was Teleso Interlandi. We just named him. So you can see one of the cover of this uh, review. It's the cover of uh, number three. Mm, of September 1938, and you see a, a man with a word, Roma's word, this, this is a daga, a, Rome, a typical uh, Rome from Romanish, how do you say Romanish <laughs> word, uh, that separate the Aryan Italian from the Jews and the colored or the population of the colonies, African colonies of Italy. So, oh, then, in the course of the same year, in 1938, oppressive le uh, legislation in defense of the race, I quote, was enacted. This is also another uh, very interesting uh, example of the Italian racism uh, it's a um, publication on the La Difesa della Razza. The author of the article is Guido Landrea, the young anthropologist who uh, ro wrote the Manifesto of the Razza. The title is I Bastardi. And let me see, I have no very. <laughs> ecco I, I read in Italian. Ecco i frutti dell'immondo ibridismo. Immondo ibridismo. Tanto caro ai francesi, fanciulli di padre marocchino e di madre tedesca nati durante l'occupazione della Ruhr. This is what uh, in Italy Mussolini wanted to avoid. No? No hybridism. No meticciato auf Italienisch. Auf in Italian. Meticciato. Ok, perfetto. So, eccoci. Ok. Um, in the course of the same, okay, oppressive legislation in defense of the race was enacted. All Jews were expelled from schools through a measure passed in September 1938 predating the similar German order by two months. Ousted from all public offices, marginalized in professions, and eliminated from cultural activities. You know these uh, uh, pictures published uh, always on the Defesa della Razza that shows all the prohibitions. In addition, severe limitations were placed on their right to own property and business. Racially mixed marriages were prohibited. 
This measure was just taken by the Germany in 1935, but the Italy was the second country in the world to adopt this uh, uh, legislation um, that prohibited the mixed marriages. Uh, the following countries was Romanian, but uh, in the first phase of the Second World War in 1940. A partial exemption, exemption to the persecutory measures was allowed for Jews of particular political or military merit, such as early supporters of the fascist party or heroes from the Great War, who were allowed to keep assets and their jobs in some part. At the same time, resident permits were revoked from the majority of foreign Jews living in Italy, and as a result, more than half of them left Italy between 1938 and 1940. When Italy entered the war in June 1940, the fascist government arrested and interned the remaining foreign Jews, and those Italian Jews considered most dangerous. And then, in 1942, introduced forced labor for the persecuted. Mussolini's ultimate objective was to expel all Italian Jews from the country within 10 years. There was a proposal of law that uh, was stopped by Mussolini, but Mussolini announced to the Jewish community, Italian community, that his uh, will was to expel all the Italian Jews within 10 years. I don't remember the following image. I try. Okay. <laughs> you can say one of the effects of the Russian laws in Italy, questo negozio è ariano. Mm -hmm. This shop is Arian. This is an Arian shop. The phase of the persecution of Jewish rights was carried out from 1938 to 1943 when the Kingdom of Italy signed the, the armistice with the Allies. This policy was followed from uh, September nine, uh, 1943 to April 1945, uh, 45, okay, by the persecution of Jewish lives. In central and northern Italy, it was implemented by the German occupation forces with the willing collaboration of the administrative and propagandist apparatus of the Italian Social Republic and the Republican Fascist Party. In the stated tenets of the Italian Republican Fascist Party, the so-called Charter of Verona, La Carta di Verona, from November uh, 14, 1943, Jews were defined as foreigners who belonged to an enemy nationality. Consequently, on uh, 30th November 1943, the Minister of the Interior, Buffarini Guidi of the Republic of Salò, ordered the arrest of all Jews, with exception of the elderly and seriously ill, the confiscation of their assets and their internment in detention, detention camps. Interned Jews were systematically handed over to the Germans who deported them to extermination camps, most of them to Auschwitz. Records indicate 6,806 people were deported from Italy, approximately uh, 4,300 Italian Jews and 2,500 foreigners. And the majority of them 5,969, uh, including 600 children, were killed. To that total, we must add approximately another 1,000 deportees whom have not yet been identified. The, uh, the um, 1,820 Jews deported by the Germans from the Italian held territories in the Aegean island in particular road, and about 320 Jews who died in Italy as a result of the persecution. Overall, around 22% of the persecuted Jews in Italy were deported or killed in the country. What was the reaction of Italians to this persecution of the Jews in their nation? Here, too, we have to distinguish between the persecution of Jewish rights 
that occurred from 1938 to 1943, and their extermination from 1943 uh, to 1945. The state apparatus from the national to the local level was meticulous in applying regulation that excluded Jews from the normal course of civic life. And the fascist party actively participated in the anti-Semitic campaign with particular zeal and, and enthusiasm shown by the youth organization, for example, by the so-called so GUF, Gruppi Universitari Fascisti. In addition, and at this point, the media completely bought into the crusade, which was contributed to by, to by scientists, doctors, anthropologists, biologists, psychiatrists, and genetists, who raised no doubts about the racist, racist policies. The only question that arose between the supporters was whether there existed a biological basis for the racism, in line with the German example, or whether the racism was, was based on cultural or spiritual factors, um, spiritual factors. Those adhering to the latter belief wore it as a badge of Italian racism, the specificity of Italian racism. As demonstrated in a recent book by Mario Avagliano and Marco Palmieri, Purebred Aryan Italy in the Face of Racial Law, edited last year, uh, published last year, it wasn't that Italian society lacked perplexity over the regime's racial laws or hostility toward them. In fact, private citizens engaged in small acts of solidarity with the victims, but there was a lack of significant and widespread rebellion or refusal to comply with the laws. The Catholic Church protested only against measures targeting mixed, mixed marriages between Jewish and Catholics. As for the rest, the Catholic uh, Church accepted the limitation of Jewish rights. The predominant attitude among Italian men and women was one of indifference. Ultimately, this attitude contributed to the persecution achieving its goal the isolation and the exclusion of the Jews from the rest of society. Uh, State-sponsored anti-Semitism proved quite effective at inoculating this prejudi prejudice in Italians in a very brief period of time, as is ev evidenced in letters sent to Il Duce, many of them anonym anonymously denouncing the Jews. The phase of Jewish extermination, which commenced with the occupation by the Germans after September 1943. Just a moment, I remember that I have something else. But maybe you, you this is some uh, synagogue, how do you say synagogue in Italy, this, uh, this, um, damaged by Italians, uh, 1941. 1942, in the first phase of the war, before the occupation of the, um, of the Germans. This is a synagogue in uh, Trieste, and this, the other is in Ferrara. We show the, the, in some way the effect of the state anti-Semitism. I come back to my text, OK. <coughs> This is my table here in, <laughs> in Bruxelles. <laughs> I have taken this photograph today. <laughs> well, maybe some of one was wondering, what's this, that piece of uh, wood? <laughs> OK. Uh, uh, the phase of Jewish extermination, which commenced with the occupation by Germans after September 1943, after these things uh, occurred, so many acts of solidarity and support of the persecuted population on the part of ordinary citizens, representatives of uh, the civil administration and the Catholic Church. However, that period wo was also characterized by zealous collaboration on the part of many citizens ready to expose Jews because of their own hatred or self-interest. 
And the men of the Social Republic, police, military, officials of the state and the fascist party, the black shirts, were evil involved in hunting down and arresting Jews to be handed over to their German executioners. It turns out that of the 4,727 documented cases of Jews arrested in Italy, out of a total of 6,806, 2,444 of those arrests were carried out by Germans, 1,951 by Italians, and 322 by Italians and Germans together. together. So Italian authorities were involved in just under half of the arrests made on Italian soil. Often these uh, of, uh, officials were put on the trail of the victims thanks to reports by other Italians who certainly were not motivated by a sense of solidarity. Before moving on to the construction of memory of the fascist persecution of the Jews, it's worth recalling here the main interpretations offered by historiography, focusing in particular on the crucial question of the antisemitic turn of the regime. One of the most important historians of fascism, Renzo De Felice, author of the first in-depth work on anti-Jewish persecution in Italy, published in 1961, highlighted how anti-Semitism was marginal in the fascist ideology. He explained Mussolini's belated adoption of anti-Semitism as a result of his desire to cement his alliance with Hitler following the birth of the Rome-Berlin Axis in 1936. Other authors, such as Michele Sarfatti and Giorgio Fabre, have more recently tied the regime's anti-Semitism to domestic politics, interpreting it as an outlet for anti-Jewish anti hostilities, which came to the forefront in the mid-30s, but were harbored by Mussolini and the fashion ruling class from the start of the dictatorship, if not even earlier when Mussolini was a prominent member of the Socialist Party. This is the position, uh, first of all, of Giorgio Fabre. Another reading, as proposed by French historian Marianne Matar Bonucci, emphasized the fascination that the anti-Semitism of Nazi Germany exerted on Mussolini, who viewed it as a useful tool to revitalize the totalitarian dynam dynamism of the regime, the consensus for which was waning after the formation of the empire. Uh, the fascism reached the, the peak of the consensus with the war against Ethiopia and the, um, the conquest of the empire, but very suddenly lose, lost this consensus. Thus, anti-Semitism was to have served as I quote uh, Marianne uh, Matar Bonucci, as a sort of electric shock, electroshock, for Italian fascism to jumpstart the totalitarian project and, and anthropological project to create the new fascist man. <coughs> Lastly, another interpretation was put forth by Italian historian Angelo Ventura, who in some ways amalgamated the previous viewpoints. He, in fact, posited that uh, racism and anti-Semitism were inherent to fascism, whose ideology was based on the supremacy of the nation and on the idea of a hierarchical society. And at the same time, he recognized the importance of the historical context marked by the alliance with Hitler and how the German example influenced anti-Semitic policies in Italy. These varying interpretations, however, all agree that what was missing was a direct intervention on the part of Berlin pressuring Rome to institute anti-Semitic policies. 
In fact, there is no documented, documented evidence of this. The presumed intervention by Nazi Germany was based on the construction immediately after the end of the war of a master narrative destined to mold Italian memory and national consciousness for a long time to come. And we pass now to the part on the memory. The cornerstones of this narrative are explained in the first general work devoted to fascist racial policy, Storia tragica e grotesca del razzismo fascista, a tragic and grotesque history of fascist racism, published in 1946 by an anti-fascist Jewish writer, the lawyer and journalist Eucardio Momigliano, cousin of the better known historian Arnaldo Momigliano. The book followed four main lines of interpretation. First, Antisemitism, according to Momigliano, had no roots in the Italian cultural traditions. He affirmed Italy has never known antisemitism. Second, the anti -Jewish, Jewish policy was imposed on Mussolini by Hitler. Fascist racism, wrote Momigliano, had only one origin and only one end to persecute 40,000 Italians by order of Adolf Hitler. And we know that this was, wasn't true. Third, the outright rejection of the Italian people and their tenacious opposition to the, to the application of the anti-Jewish laws and the human solidarity and brave assistance offered by the Italians and by the Catholic Church to the Jews large numbers of whom were thus saved from the annihilating fury of the Nazis. And this was uh, in part true. Um, fourth, the clear distinction between Italians and Germans, the latter described as obsessed with anti-Semitism and strong supporters of the extermination policy of the Third Reich. Momigliano bo Momigliano's book, met with warm re reception since it reflected the attitudes and cliché commonplace at that time, despite the fact that some of them were completely groundless, such as the idea of the German imposition, I've just said, of the anti-Semitic policy, or that uh, anti-Semitism had no roots in Italy. First of all, the author expressed, expressed the basic attitude of the Italian Jewish community in the immediate post-war period, led to praise the solidarity of their Catholic fellow citizens and to neglect the widespread complicity of vast sectors of the Italian society with the racial policy of fascism. In fact, Italian Jews were interested in a rapid reconciliation and reintegration in the national community after the painful lac laceration caused by fascism considered a chapter to close as soon as possible. Some literary works and memoirs by Jewish writers, such as Giacomo de Benedetti, did mention the Italian responsibilities in the persecution uh, from the phenom phenomenon of delation, uh, delazioni, okay, uh, secret accusations, to fascist authorities, to the collaboration of the Italian police with the Germans in the preparation of the list of Jews to be deported. Such suggestions, however, continued to be a minority and were completely ignored. The representation of the Italian people as totally hostile to anti-Semitism and diligent in the assistance offered to the Jews being hunted down by the Germans was also shared by the whole, whole of anti-fascist culture. Such, as, uh, such a portrait fit perfectly with the basic interpretation of fascism and the war that was elaborated by anti-fascism, founded on an opposition between the Italian people and the fascist regime, considered a dictatorship hated by the Italians and imposed on them by Mussolini by force and deceit. The hostility of the Italians to the anti-Semitic laws 
and the aid offered to the persecuted Jews after 1943, as stressed by Momigliano, were considered an expression of the anti-fascist sentiment nourished by the Italian people and of their rebellion against Mussolini's puppet regime, la Repubblica di Salò. The experience of the extermination was thus interpreted within the framework of the anti-fascist hegemonic narrative. Another two factors made Momigliano's reconstruction an authentic master narrative. The attitude of the Catholic Church and the ob objective of the Italian foreign policy. The attitude of the Church toward fascist antisemitism had been ambiguous. While opposing the radicalization of the latter, the Church had intervened to defend not so much the violated rights, rights of the Jews, but some prerogative of its own in relation to mixed marriages and conver conversion. Moreover, Catholic anti-Judaism had cleared the path for the spread of fascist propaganda. In the same way, if on the one hand, with the start of the persecution of life, many churches and convents had sheltered many Jews, on the other, it is well known that Pope Pius XII never clearly pronounced a condemnation of the persecution and extermination. Hence, we can understand how after the war, through official declarations and publication of various kinds, the Vatican emphasized the voices emerging from the Jewish community itself, uh, lavishing praise on the rescue efforts of the church. Underscoring the lights was an excellent way of distracting attention from the shadows of the past. Finally, the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs played what the historian Guri Schwarz, Italian historian Guri Schwarz, has called the Jewish card. This is a point I alluded to in my inaugural lecture last Monday. A defeated enemy nation subjected in 1943 to an unconditional surrender, Italy was later recognized by the Allies as a co-belligerent in October 1943. However, the, this did not substantially alter the country's international status. The threat of a punitive peace accord hung over Italy's head for the Axis war it had waged alongside Germany. To counter this threat, the foreign ministry developed a strategy designed to draw as clear cut as possible a distinction between the Italian behavior and that of the former German ally. As early as autumn 1944, uh, an operation was launched to collect evidence of the efforts by Italian authorities to rescue the Jews from the clutches of German persecutors in the occupied territories, especially in southern France, Yugoslavia, and Greece. This documentation was used to create a dossier in 1946, uh, Relazione sull'opera svolta dal Ministero degli Affari Esteri per la tutela delle comunità ebraiche, 1938-1943, which was used by Italian diplomats during the peace treaty negotiations underway in Paris. It also helped nourish a press campaign in both national and foreign newspapers, particularly in the American press, aimed at underscoring the self-absolving image of the good Italian, savior of the Jews. And there was some truth to this, uh, of the Jews present in Italy, we have seen, uh, present in Italy in, in 1943, 77% uh, uh, survived the war. Uh, from Leon Poliakov and Jacques Sabil's uh, 1955 volume, Jews Under the Italian Occupation, uh, which was based on the documentation of the Italian mm, foreign minister. It's very important, this point. Uh, to numerous works in the 80s and 90s by Anglo-Saxon and Israeli historians, uh, such as uh, Susan Zucotti and Jonathan Steinberg, among the, formers, uh, the former, and Menachem Shelai, Daniel Karpir, the latter, there exists an ample foreign historiography that underlines the merits of the Italian humanitarian efforts, both within the national 
borders and in the European territories occupied by Mussolini. This was, however, only a part of the truth. Italian diplomatic and military authorities had in fact protected numerous Jews in France and in the Balkans, but as demonstrated by Davide Rodogno, an Italian scholar, such behavior was not always the practice. In many instances, Jews were sought refuge, were turned back by Italians or handed over directly to their Nazi persecutors or to the Croatian Ustasha. It, should, it shouldn't be forgotten either that Jews were rescued not only for humanitarian reasons, which certainly exist, but also to protect national prestige. German interference in areas controlled by Ita the Italians was not, was not welcome. And at times, money or valuables were extorted in exchange for hate. Further, this self-absolving image of the good Italian was manipulated to cover up the serious war crimes committed against civilians in the occupied territories, especially in the Balkans. Uh, gen for, for example, Generale Roata, who was the, mm, the protagonist of the rescue, the, the protection of the Jews, was number one in the list, Yugoslavian list of uh, Italian war criminals. So he, uh, he acted to save the Jews on one end, but on the other, he uh, gave orders to kill thousands of Slovenians and Croatians. The convergence of different perceptions and interests, those of the Jewish community, of the anti-fascist culture, of the Vatican, and of the Italian governments, rapidly cemented a sort of narrative code, or canon, based on an almost complete repression of the Italian responsibility in the persecution of the rights of the Jews between 1938 and 1943. It focused instead on the merits acquired in the protection of the persecuted in the following phase, 43-45, uh, marked by the persecution of lives, the, res the responsibility for which was attributed entirely to the Germans with the support of an, a handful of fanatic Italian fascists. Finally, the reality of the Holocaust continued to be interpreted through the lens of the anti-fascist paradigm which considered the Jews as just one of the categories of the victim of Nazi fascism, attributing a leading role to the partisans and the political deportees. Oh, just a moment. Okay. Following this init initial, initial phase, uh, the first signs of change emerged between the late 50s and the early 60s with the growth of interest in and knowledge about the experience of the Holocaust at the event, also in Italy, of the so-called era of the witness. In this sense, uh, the repercussion of the Heichmann trial of 1961 were also important for Italy. But even prior to this, we should recall the publication by Naudi in 1958 of Primo Levi's masterpiece, If This Is a Man, Se Questo è un Uomo. This is Primo Levi, of course. I have. <laughs> yes, I'm right. Um, uh, Se Questo è un Uomo, uh, rejected in 1947 by the same Turin publishing house, and then published by a minor publisher in a few hundred copies. This is the first edition, the, the cover of the first edition of Sequestio Un Uomo, uh, published in Turin by the Edizione De Silva in 2000 uh, copies. Most of them remain um, unsold. After the now this publication, uh, Primo Levi's success was confirmed by the publication in 1963 of his second book, The Truce, devoted to his experience of returning from the lager, which immediately won one of the most prestigious Italian literary awards. It's worth taking a moment to reflect on the role Levy played in the Italian culture until his suicide in 1987, 
the year after the publication of the book that contained his most mature reflection on the Shoah, yeah, referring here to the, the damned and the saved, Isomezzi Salvati. Uh, after a late start in the beginning of the 60s, Levy's culture influence grew rapidly. Thanks to a now this mm, mm, publication in 1973 of a Maids for Schools version of If This is a Man, this is the cover, this is the book I have used when I was a child in the school, the same. <laughs> Uh, hundreds of thousands of Italian students were introduced to his work. In the mid-70s, Levy started collaborating regularly with La Stampa, one of Italy's major newspapers. He achieved his peak cultural influence in the mid-80s, at the same time he was being canonized by American culture, which recognized him as one of the key international authors in the world of witness literature produced by survivors of the Shoah. But as, uh, as has been noted by one of the greatest scholars of his work, British historian Robert Gordon, Levy was never a dominant voice shaping the Italian cultural view. Rather, he was a, I, I quote uh, Gordon, a weak agent of memory. An enormously respected figure, a role model of morality, certainly a well-known author, but nothing comparable, for example, to Elie Wiesel, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, who had developed close relationships with US and world leaders. But now let's return to our discussion uh, of the hand of the 50s. A new wind also blew through the Catholic Church after the hand of the papacy of Pius XII in 1958 and the advent of John XXII. Uh, For example, in 1959, the liturgical formula of the, I don't know the translation correct, faithless Jews, I think perfidious Jews, perfidi Judei in, in Italiano, was revised with the derogatory adjective being removed from the Good Friday prayer and from the rite of baptism. Later on, the revisions undertaken in the Second Vatican Council that resulted in the declaration Nostra Etate, our age, in October 1965, confirmed the spiritual bond with Judaism and negated any responsibility of the Jews for the death of Christ which had been one of the typical accusations by traditional Catholic anti-Judaism. The emergence in the early 60s in Italy, as in other European countries, of an anti-Semitic attitude generated in the Catholic press a new wave of attention towards the extermination of the Jews. Nevertheless, Italian Catholic culture failed to come effectively to terms with the historic responsibility of the, of the church in the persecution of the rights of the Jews. The 1963 debut of Rolf Ochhut's plays, The Representative, Il Vicario in Italiano, which accused the silence of Pius XII, caused a defensive backlash based upon the apologetic claim of the role played by the Catholic Church as protector and, and savior of the Jews. To characterize this phase was the publication in 1961 uh, of the first substantial study about fascist per, uh, persecution of the Jews. We have just mentioned it, uh, the book of Renzo de Felice, Storia degli ebrei italiani sotto il fascismo, a history of Italian Jews under fascism which was destined to remain the primary historical benchmark until to the end of the 80s. Commissioned by the Union of the Italian Jewish Communities, which plays all their records at the Felice disposal, the book exploded the myth that anti-Semitism had been imposed on Mussolini by Germany, what was affirmed by Momigliano, you remember, while confirming the idea that the anti-Semitic policy was rejected in unblock by the nation and in practice was implemented sparsely and badly. In the following editions, 
especially those of 1988 and 1993, as in the volumes of Mussolini's biography, uh, De Felice wrote uh, nine books so <laughs> about the biography of Mussolini, Mm, the author stress the contrast between the Italian case and that of Germany, the latter being considered as a sort of model of anti-Semitic totalitarianism used to measure the Italian experience, which emerged in a very softened version. This gave way to what David Bidusa, an Italian intellectual, in the book Il Mito del Bravo Italiano, the Myth of the Good Italian, published in uh, 1996, has called the demon of analogy, the comparison between fascism and, and uh, Nazism as a demon of analogy, a misuse of the comparison that led to a stiffening of the judgment and which prevented a real understanding of fascist antisemitism. An emblematic expression of this was the strong statement made by De Felice in December 1987 in a famous interview in the leading Italian newspaper Corriere della Sera, where the historian De Felice underlined the fact that, I quote, Italian fascism is safe from accusation of genocide. It is beyond the shadow of con of the Holocaust. And he also added that uh, Italian fascism in is uh, uh, under some aspects uh, better than uh, France fascism and Dutch fascism. The phrase following this. Overall, the Felice's historiographical position reinforced the myth of the good Italian. And for the duration of the 60s and the 70s, this viewpoint was shared by the culture of the right which contrasted the good nature of the fascist dictatorship with that of the Nazi dictator's brutality, and by the culture of the left, which emphasized the Italian hate offered to the persecuted Jews as proof of widespread anti-fascism. I don't remember the, no, okay, over. <laughs> it's too soon, don't, don't look at this. <laughs> A real turning point in the memory of fascist anti-Semitism was, do you know this man? Never heard by him? No? I will explain who he is. A real turning point in the memory of uh, fascist anti-Semitism was experienced in Italy starting in 1988 on the 50th anniversary of the introduction of the racial laws. Underlying this was, first and foremost, a fertile new crop of historiographical research. The Centro di Documentazione Ebraica Contemporanea, Centre for Jewish Contemporary Documentation, SEDEC of Milan, played a crucial role in stimulating the research. Uh, I note that the centre was established in 1955, but became a foundation in, in 1986. Pivotal works were published by the current director of the SEDEC, Michele Sarfatti, on fascist anti-Semitic legislation and on the relations between the Hebrew community and fascism, which illustrated the per pervasiveness of the regime's actions against the Jews. In 1991, after 20 years' work, one of the major collaborators of the Centre, Liliana Picciotto Fargion, published the first edition of the Libro della Memoria, the Book of Memory, an irreplaceable volume with a list of all the Italian Jewish victims detailing the circumstances of their arrest and their destination. Also of great importance was the in-depth examination of the indigenous cultural origins of fascist antisemitism analyzing both the contribution of Catholic anti-Judaism, see Giovanni Miccoli's and also Elena Mazzini's works, and the previously unexplored involvement of demographic, eugenetic, anthropological sciences. Noted authors include Roberto Maiocchi, Giorgio Israel, Piet Pietro Nastasi, Francesco Cassata. Among the various aspects studied by historians, 
There are also those focusing on the relation between fascist racism in the, col in the colonies and the anti-Semitism of the regime. Uh, see the works by Nicola Labanca. The implementation of racial laws at universities, uh, Ilaria Pavan. The phenomenon of deletion, the role of the fascist police in the arrest and deportation. Uh, we can uh, cite the works by Mimo Franzinelli and Amedeo Ostiguerrazzi. And the meticulous studies on mun municipal and regional realities, such as uh, Fabio Levi's book on Turin and that on Tuscany, coordinated by Enzo Collotti. The two volume history of the Italian Shoah, edited by Marcello Flores, Simon Levi Sulam, Marianne Matard Bonucci, and Enzo Traverso. And Enzo Traverso and published in 2010 by UTET, can be considered a compendium of this series of studies. The result of this research radically modified previous historiographical coordinates. The capi capillary nature of, of anti-Semitic legislation and practice the Italian involvement in the persecution of the Jews before and during the war, with important roles in the deportation and extermination, these aspects revealed alongside the historically grounded view of the Italian as good people, capable of solidarity and generous in their assistance to the Jews, the embarrassing and previously repressed reality of many bad countrymen, behaving as persecutors, informers, profiters, or simply just turning their heads and not caring. The attention to the responsibilities of Italian culture and society was not restricted to the history books. It also circulated in a broader public, thanks to new memoirs. We can cite, for example, for um, solo violin, per violino solo by Aldo Zargani, published in, in 1995 and translated into various languages, several important exhibitions, significant testimonies on television, such as those collected in the do documentary Memoria by Ruggero Gabbai, and above all, to highly successful literary works and film, films, such as the book La Parola Ebreo, The Word Jew, by Rosetta Loi, and Roberto Benigni's film La Vita è Bella. Both released in 1997, these two works, uh, works dealt with the persecution of Italian Jews, linking the fascist persecution of the years 1938 to 1943 to the following stage of deportation and extermination. Uh, I, I think that many of you uh, know very well the, the film, uh, Benigni's film, La Vita è Bella. The, if the movie is uh, divided in two half. The first is on the Italian persecution of the Jews' uh, rights, and the second is on, uh, it's about the extermination experience in, in a German camp. Alongside the focus on the Italian dimension of the phenomenon, there was a widespread general increase of interest in the Holocaust. Starting with the 1995 translation into Italian of Raoul Hilberg's books, book, The Destruction of the European Jews, there was a renewed interest shown by publishers in the outcome of international historiogra historiography, whose main uh, contribution were largely translated and published. Uh, Saul Friedlander, Christopher Browning, Hans Mommsen, Omar Bartov, Daniel Goldhagen, to name a few. There was, uh, there was uh, also a group of national historiography whose most representative example was the two volume Storia della Shoah, History of the Shoah, edited in 2005 by Marina Cataruzza, Marcello Flores, Simon Levi Sullam, and Enzo Traverso. In this case, too, the Holocaust was released from a strictly historical field progressively gaining ground in the collective memory, not the least thanks to the success of various films such as Steven Spielberg's uh, Schindler List, broadcast for the first time on Rai, the Italian National Channel, in 1997. So you see that 1997 is a very important <laughs> turning point for the, for the memory of uh, 
the Shoah and also for the memory of uh, fascist anti-Semitism. Uh, since the second half of the 90s, in Italy, the question of the Holocaust has been at the core of active policies of memory. The general picture to bear in mind here is the crisis of the anti-fascist paradigm based on the centrality of the memory of the resistance. This crisis became evident in the early 90s with the collapse of the so-called First Republic, and the birth under the ages of Silvio Berlusconi of a strong centre-right pole interested in redefining the basis of the public national memory. Uh, we deepened this argument in the la last les lesson lecture. Uh, one of the central issues was the need of the democratic legitimization of one of the most important political parties of the centre-right namely Alleanza Nazionale, National Alliance, the party born from the uh, neo-fascist Movimento Sociale Italiano, Italian Social Movement. The path chosen by the leader of the party, of Alleanza Nazionale, Gianfranco Fini, to burn the bridges with an uncomfortable past was the condemnation of fascist anti-Semitism and the full acknowledgement of the memory of the Holocaust. The first step along this path was Fini's visit to Auschwitz in 1999, ending with his visit to Israel in 2003, where he condemned the, I quote, infamous racial laws of 1938 and defined fascism as an absolute evil since it was co-responsible for the Shoah. However, this purification right by the leader was followed by benevolent judgments of fascism by right-wing representatives and newspapers, as if the racial laws had only been a mere stain for a regime with some historical merit. Finally, pivotal for the collective memory was the introduction in July 2000 of the Giornata della Memoria, Holocaust Memorial Day, in commemoration of the Shoah created by Law 211, which was proposed by two centre-left members of the parliament and approved almost unanim unanimously by the Italian parliament. The date chosen, as in many other European nations, was the 27th of January, the day the gates of Auschwitz were broken down, the first proposed date of October 16, which recalls the 1943 roundup uh, of the ghetto in Roma at the hands of the Germans in collaboration with Italian police authorities, was rejected. Rather, January 27 was a day that invoked exclusive German responsibility for the Shoah. The law prescribed the commemoration, I quote, of the, uh, I quote the Article 1, the commemoration of the Shoah, extermination of Jewish people, racial laws, Italy's persecution of their Jewish citizens, Italians who underwent deportation, imprisonment, and death, as well as those differing positions uh, and allegiances who opposed the extermination project at, at their own life's risk save others and protected the persecuted. <laughs> the result of uh, a lively parliamentary debate between right and left, the law aims to be an acknowledgement of guilt and a commemoration of the victims, but the word fascism is never mentioned. As we have seen, a section in the law is also devoted to Italian merit in offering help to the Jews. In short, the law provides for the commemoration of the good Italian. Since then, in the last years, the Giornata della Memoria has gained more and more importance. In addition to numerous official commemorative ceremonies, a vast array of cultural productions dedicated to the Shoah has also developed. Ex exhibits, publications, shows, public testimonies by survivors, and so on. 
These commemorations have been characterized along two distinct lines. On one hand, left-wing local governments and associations, in particular, have developed school-oriented reflections and initiatives dedicated to the memory of the anti-Jewish persecution of national socialism and fascism, and also to the deportation of Italian soldiers and political opponents to German laggards. Laggards. On the other hand, the right wing has revealed a tendency to favor the celebration of episodes of solidarity and assistance shown by the Italians to the Jews. A central role was assumed by the valorization of the figure, figure of Giorgio Perlasca, his man, an Italian trader, previously a fascist volunteer soldier in Ethiopia and in Spain by the side of Franco, who with skill and courage managed to save thousands of Jews in Hungary, posing as the Spanish consul in Budapest. He spoke perfectly uh, Spanish, and the Spanish consul uh, was never in Budapest. And he said, I am the co Spanish consul. And so in this way, he can give uh, documents to the Jews and save lots of Jews, uh, 5,000 Jews. For his efforts, he received the recognition of Rateus among the nations um, that, as you know, is an honorific given by the State of Israel to Gentiles who, who hated Jews during the war. Books, documentaries, and even a television series titled Perlasca, an Italian hero, which was hired in 2002 to huge success, have been dedicated to him. The good fascist Perlaska was soon joined by other figures considered savior of the Jews, such as police functionary Giovanni Palatucci, this one, who died at the German concentration camp Dachau after having allegedly worked to save many Jews in Dalmatia, or more recently, the Italian consul of Thessaloniki, Guelfo Zamboni, who saved hundreds of Jews from the Nazis by granting them temporary Italian citizenship. Thus, we can see two fascist government officials who demonstrated strong humanitarian virtues. However, the Primo Levi Center in New York has recently, last year, raised many doubts about the real work of Palatucci who, in reality, zealously applied the anti-Semitic laws of the fascist government and, after 1943, helped a much smaller number of Jews than had been previously attributed to him. I can show you. It's too small. This is a declaration by Anti-Defamation League, based in New York, that, can you see? No, you can read or, yes? Okay. <laughs> in view of new historical evidence that has come to light documenting that an Italian police official, Giovanni Palatucci, did not play a role in rescuing Jews during the Holocaust, as was widely believed and may have in fact been a Nazi collaborator, the Anti-Defamation League will no longer present law enforcement official with an award named for him. There was an award named for uh, Palatucci that uh, the Anti-Defamation League uh, uh, gave. And so they have uh, <laughs> uh, eliminated the re reference to Palatucci. Uh, Palatucci is very important. Uh, all the, it's, it was a, um, a police official, and all the po police department in Italy as dedicate uh, uh, ceremonies to him. For example, in Padua, in Padu, Padu <laughs> where I teach, uh, in front of the police department, th there is a place uh, that is named Piazza Palatucci, Piazza Giovanni Palatucci. I don't know if they na now have to rename the place. I, I don't think so. <laughs> but it's very important is, uh, so, um, in any case, in any case, figures such as Perlasca e Zamboni, not Palatucci, 
whose story has long remained in the shadows, sh certainly merit recognition. At the same time, however, by pushing the image of the good Italians again, it risks being turned into a convenient alibi for the national conscience which, as we have seen, only began to come to terms with the legacy of fascist anti-Semitism after 1988. And I have, I have done a proof this afternoon. I, I went to Google, Italian version of Google, and I um, have proved to indicate Giorgio Perlasca. And this is the result. 200,017, uh, uh, how do you say, results, contact, contacts. For Palatucci, you see. And for Giovanni Francesco Martelloni, 57. Who is Giovanni Francesco Martelloni? Giovanni Francesco Martelloni is a, was a police officer in Florence responsible for the arrest and the deportation of over 300 Jews. He was a bad Italian, but no, nobody knows him. If you go on, uh, on Google, you say the difference. Good Italian, savior of the Jews, false <laughs> Perlasca, which I into the set in your context, and Giovanni Francesco Martelloni, 57. This is a very impressive sign for me to the, um, about the, uh, the Italian memory of the uh, fascist uh, uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, just a, a few. <laughs> I am finishing. Other critical voices such as that of the historian Giovanni De Luna, have recently been raised deploring the fact that the memory of the Shoah celebrated on the uh, 27th of January is uh, progressively undermining that of the resistance celebrated as a national holiday on the 25th of April, the day uh, of anti-fascist insurrection in 1945. Uh, here it comes out the question of the competing memories. This fear is not groundless. However, I do not think that we need to be greatly alarmed by the recognition of a specificity of the memory of the Shoah for a long time seen only through the lens of anti-fascism. Instead, rather disturbing is the skewed view that the public memory of the Shoah is assuming in Italy, with the Italians portrayed exclusively in the victim's shoes or as saviors, but never as disinterested bystanders or accomplices of the executioners. The celebratory approach of the Giornata della Memoria thus risks once again permitting Italians in escape from responsibility with the usual self-absolving and self-gratifying collective identification with the whole cliche of the human and heroic Italian savior of the Jews. Thank you very much. Time for questions. Questions can be asked in French, in Italian, in German. Uh, e eventually, I will translate. Okay. <laughs> 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 Just a question factual. Is you have not given the number of Jews in Italy at the beginning of the war? What is the number of Jews? And so the proportion of Jews deported and exterminated? 6,600 known Jews known in the list and another 1,000. So Mm, about uh, eight, eight thousand. Oui, ça vous avez dit euh, pendant l'exposé, mais combien de juifs il y avait au moment euh, le, le chiffre de la population the, juive the, en Italie? Okay. The, the, the Jewish community in Italy was about fifty thousand before the war, when the racist laws were in, uh, implemented in 1938, but they were forty about 40,000 uh, in 1943 when the 
uh, deportation and extermination began. Because most of them in the, in, in the years before uh, were in, uh, went to um, out abroad, of the Italy, abroad. abroad, escape from Italy. The, the half of the foreign Jews, uh, 5,000 people, escaped from Italy between 19, uh, 1938 and the beginning of the war in the 1940. So the number of the, uh, of the Jews pres present, present in Italy uh, was not, uh, in, in, in 1943, was not 50,000, but much less more. And how many in the Repubblica de Salo? The, yeah, yeah, it's the same number. It's the same number because all the all the the um, uh, all the the, uh, the Jews in Italy was concentrated in Saint Northern Italy between the the Alpi and Rome. There was some. It is, I, I have to precise that uh, there was there weren't some concentration camp for Jews in, in the south of Italy. The most important camp was in Calabria, Ferramonti di Tarsia, and there there was there, there were uh, two or three thousand foreign Jews. But all the other Jews were were in the center and northern Italy. The um, the per percentage, uh, the the bigger biggest per percentage. Uh, of Jews were in uh, Trieste, uh, where was a two percent, two percent of the population of the city. It's not, a, of, of course, it's not a big community. Eh? It's very, very ancient. The community in Rome was the more, anci more ancient community in Europe. But. Uh. <laughs> in, uh, in English, uh, uh, I'm going to try. Um, I read uh, a book of uh, Shlomo Venezia. Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, a man uh, who was uh, in the Zonderkommando and in uh, Auschwitz, and uh, he, he leave his uh, témoignage uh, uh, as a witness uh, of uh, this uh, uh, precise uh, operation in the, in the Auschwitz, uh, I, I think, we can know. And, um, this man uh, um, came from uh, uh, Thessaloniki, uh, no, uh, from Greece. From he Greece. lives in Greece. He was uh, an um, adolescent, mm -hmm. and um, uh, he came from. Uh, fa his family came from uh, Spain in, uh, uh, in the 15th century. Mm -hmm. he, he passed through uh, Italy, uh, Venezia, uh, who came. Uh, his, na his name. Uh, come from from this passage, and then uh, he, he tells. Uh, my question is about uh, that. Uh, he, he tells that um, 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 a partir uh, uh, nine, uh, 1943, the, the German came in Greece and mm -hmm. in the whole islands, and then they persecute the, the Jews who, who stay uh, in Greece, and uh, they persecute uh, with uh, method methodically, and then. Uh, Voilà. My question, and uh, in the preface of the, the book, uh, mm -hmm. Simone Veil tells also that uh, she lives in Nice, who was in the occupation of Italy in 19, 1940, and then uh, it's the same logic, in 1943 the German uh, arrives, mm -hmm. and then uh, that my question, but uh, I was uh, then uh, astonished, not astonished, but uh, uh, I discover uh, the um, racism of Italy uh, from uh, your presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. It's uh, the same of uh, the German, the Nazi one. But my question is uh, that uh, um, um, uh, during the, the fascist regime, uh, s certain Jew was not uh, were not uh, more uh, persecuted. Then, uh, then uh, when the, the German arrives, uh, the, uh, mm -hmm. okay. no, the, the Italian Jews during the fascism, before the arrival of the German, was totally expelled by this, from the society. 
the, 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 the young Jewish students were ousted from the Italian schools before the German students. No, it's, it, of course we have, no, no, I, I, I thank you very much for your question. Uh, we have to, to make a distinction very clear uh, between it, Italian persecution and German persecution. It's, it's very, very clear. We, we can, we, it's not compatible in any way. The Italian Jews were, were not obliged to wear distinctive signs, no? uh, for example. Uh, but it's very important to, uh, to have in mind what uh, the fascist persecutions uh, meant for the J Italian Jews. Uh, now, after, in the last 30 years, the Italian Jewish community have began to, uh, in some ways, to claim, to accuse, in some way, to accuse the Italians. I have, uh, uh, <laughs> I have, uh, have a discussion uh, three weeks ago with uh, two colleagues of the J Jewish community in Rome. Here in Belgium, in Liège, there was a conference. And uh, I, these uh, told me, we don't, uh, we don't recognize the value of the Italian resistance, for example. Why the Italians have n didn't do nothing before the war? When the persecution started in 1943, we, we, we was totally abandoned by the Italian, by our citizens, Italian citizens. And um, maybe you, we, ha we have to, uh, to know, to understand the position of the Italian Jewish community in the immediate post-war period. Why they, don't, they didn't denounce at the time the Italian behavior. This is very in interesting for me. Um, on the official level, the, the um, union of the uh, Jewish communities of Italy didn't denounce Italy. On the contrary, they exalt, emphasize the hate received because they have, uh, th there was a difference between the persecution of the rights made by the fascists and the persecution of the lives perpetrated mainly by the Germans. It's very important. But it was, for, for the Jewish, it was very important to heal the wounds, to reintegration, for, make a reintegration in the Italian society. You have to have in mind that uh, the Jewish community in Italy was one of the most integrated before the fascism. Uh, with the resurgimento process, the unity process, of uh, Italian unification process, the, the Jews in Italy have, uh, for the first time, uh, its own rights. Uh, they participate uh, very intensively in the, um, in the Great War, for example. The percentage of the uh, Italian uh, official, Jewish official, is the higher respect, the higher respect uh, relating to, to the percentage of the Jewish official in the French army or in German army. In also Gramsci filmed this. There was an, an assimilation very, so this is a, a lot of the Jew, of the Italian Jews who ad adhered to the fascism. I have something I personally, <laughs> Of, for example, it, it is uh, about 24%, uh, um, excluding the too young, of, <laughs> obviously, um, out of a per percentage of 6% of the common Italian. Uh, so we have, there are many reasons you have to, to take in mind. Um, I don't know if I ever uh, <laughs> ask. Uh, you're speaking about the Shoah. I don't know if there was a Rom community in Italy, but uh, this point is not covered by your by your teaching, and I would like to have some information yeah. about this because it's a lost part of history. Always the same. We are not speaking about the persecution persecution of the Rom community, and mm -hmm. I would like to know if something happened about yeah, yeah. this in uh, in Italy. Jews of Rome deported 
is uh, 1,750, and not... Uh, Rome's, uh, the Rome's oh. is... Uh, ah, Roma, Roma, Roma Sinti. Okay, no, we have, we, we know very, very little about this. It's not so studied. There is just a few studies about this, uh, uh, this persecution. It, they, they happen. And there were also laws against the. Uh, no, it's, I, I, I don't. I, th I think there wasn't the specific laws against Roma, but uh, there was a control by fascist regime against all the Italian people that ca were, in some ways, uh, uh, a danger for the regime. It's not the same. It's not j the, the same like the Assoziation for Deutschland for Do uh, Nazi. It's very specific low specific targets, uh, but also uh, Italian fascist regime use the confino, so the the practice to um, to send the op the, op the opponents in, in the highland. No, uh, for example, uh, Ustica or Ventotene, little island, and to confine them there with an um, administrative uh, um, procedure. There was no um, trial, but the police, there was a commission uh, composed by a fascist uh, black shirt and uh, jurist, and, and they they, they could decide, decide to uh, put these uh, opponents for a long period also in this uh, little island <laughs> in the, at the borders of the nations. And this, this was a, a, a system, a tool to, uh, for controlling all the, the persons dangerous in some ways for the regime. There was a, a strong communist movement in Italy. Uh, Communists. You, when? Eighties and nineties. Eighties and nineties. No, there were there were for a strong. Uh, it's not my question. Let, 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 let her finish the question. Ah, okay. No, no. If, if I, I I thought it was finished. Oh, no. There, <laughs> there was a communist movement, and what was their view on the responsibility of the Italians during the war towards Jews and? Other crimes. So in, in Italy, in, in the 80s and 90s, there, wa there was uh, no more a strong <laughs> communist movement um, with the death of Rico Berlinguer in mid 80s. Uh, the party, the Communist Party, that was the strongest in the West, uh, uh, in the Western <laughs> Europe, uh, was very um, was not, not no more so strong. Uh, but the, what, what was uh, uh, the communist position? Uh, the communist position was the common anti-fascist position, uh, so to speak. Uh, does it mean that uh, it, they considered uh, the anti fascist anti-Semitism and the persecution by the point of view of the anti-fascist? So they affirmed that Italian, Italians uh, the Italian's behavior was, uh, had been the behavior of uh, people, political, anti the, pol the politics of anti anti-Semitic policy of the regime. It's not different. There was uh, no difference between Communist Party and the anti-fascist narrative. Now we have a, a total uh, turning of this position. Until the 80s, the memory of the Shoah was embedded in the memory of the resistance. Now, the opposite, in some ways, is the memory of the Shoah that contained the memory of the resistance. I have, I, I, I have re read the, the Article 1 of the, the law instituting the me Memorial Day for the Shoah, and uh, in this article, is, uh, um, this article contained a reference to the, po to the political deportation of the Italian anti-fascists 
and the deportation of the Italian soldier in the lager. So in a law that uh, is about the Shoah, you will see a reference to the political deportation, anti-fascist deportation, and the deportation of the soldier. This is very clear of the balance of power of the memories nowadays. Another example for me very interesting is very recent. Last October died in Italy uh, Erich Pripke, a SS officer who, who was condemned to sentenced to prison, life prison, by an Italian military courts in the 90s. And he, he was in prison, arrested domiciliary. He was obliged to stay in a house in Italy. And he, he died in uh, last October. He was uh, um, a protagonist of the massacre of the Fosse Ardeatine in Rome. In this massacre, were killed 335 Italians after an, uh, um, an attack against the Germans made by the Italian partisans in the center of Rome. But uh, three, 335 victims, of these, 72 were Jews. All the others were not Jews. But uh, in October, when Erich Pripke died, uh, the Italian newspaper uh, published lots of articles. There was a huge polemic because the problem was um, where we can bury, bury him. We, we, no, nobody in Italy wanted to bury him. No, no village. No. But what I, th I, 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 I found very interesting was that on the newspaper, uh, which published, as I, I, I told, uh, many, many articles, you find no voice of an anti-fascist, just voice of Jews, only voice of Jews, about a massacre uh, who, uh, with, with, with uh, the, where, um, the victims, were in part Jews, but the main part were not Jews. So the only voices allowed to speak about Erich Pripke three months ago were not the anti-fascist, were the Jews. I, I, I noticed that. No? It's, it's, for me, it's important for, as a, a sign of the, this changing, shifting of the memories uh, balance, from some, of, some time, in some ways, balance of power. I don't know if I ever <laughs> satisfy you. May, may I jump into this um, and ask what was Priebke sentenced for? Thinking of the comparison with uh, Klaus Barbie, mm -hmm. who was sentenced for the execution of a set of hostages. But since part of the hostages were Jewish, other were not, only the Jews could be considered in a sentence for crimes against humanities. The mm -hmm. others was war crimes. And 25 here, there was a statute of, of limitation. Was Priebke mm -hmm. sentenced for crimes against humanity because of the killing of the Jews? Or was the killing of the others being a war crime also um, still uh, taken under consideration by the Italian court? Uh -huh. Thank you. It's, it's interesting because Erich Priebke was sentenced for the killing of all the others. But there was three trials on uh, Erich Priebke. Uh, in the first trials, he was not condemned. Uh, but there was a, an immediate reaction by the Jewish community of, of Rome. And in some ways, they imposed another trial. It's not very clear, because our Ministry of Justice uh, said that Erich Pripke uh, has been sentenced uh, free, well, not, is, is innocent. But we have received a document from Berlin, from the German, not Berlin, not, OK, Berlin, uh, that uh, and, and Berlin want to put Erich Pripke on trial in Germany. 
So we can, uh, we can leave him free. We have to maintain Pripke in the Italian prison, and then we, I, we, we have to deliver him to, the, to Germany. But this document, nobody has never seen this document by Germany, <laughs> presumed presume document by Germany. And, the, the, and after a very, uh, some months, the Italian military justice uh, um, Annullare la sentenza. Uh, Annul the, the, the sentence and make another pro process, another trial, and then another. And at the, f in the, at the end, in the, after the third trial, Erich Pricke was sentenced to life prison. For crimes against humanity? No, or war crimes? War crimes. I could say that not all the people are equal towards history. No. <laughs> Any other questions en français, in italiano? Auf Deutsch, not too early. <laughs> <laughs> Encore en français? <laughs> um, ça, ça peut paraître choquant, mais on, je ne peux pas m'empêcher de penser qu'il um, y a quand même une. une c est, c est, allez, on va dire. Um, une différence entre la période des persécutions et du régime fasciste et la période suivante d'extermination avec euh, les nazis. Si les nazis n'avaient pas été là de octobre 43 jusqu'à la fin, les juifs seraient en vie, persécutés, mais pas morts. Mm -hmm. juste. Juste. <laughs> Maybe a spalp from Italy. Because Mussolini wanted all to expel all Italian Jews. I don't know if he could do this in, in reality, but this was. Well, could have been a re reaction to the dynamics of what happened in Portugal or in, uh, in Spain during the 15th or 16th century when they expelled yeah. all the Jews. Maybe and it was the destiny. It could, could be the destiny of. The, the reaction of the Italian population would have been completely different should Mussolini have taken this slow path take the law uh, in uh, 1941-1942 of uh, executing the Jews. I think that then the Italian population would have acted completely differently. Maybe. I, think. I, I have uh, a question on the role of the Italians as occupiers in Greece. Mm -hmm. You mentioned this uh, Greek consul in Thessaloniki Lamboni. who had a uh, um, who saved some of the, the Thessaloniki Jews, but what about places like Corfu and uh, Rhodos, um, where there were large Jewish communities and an Italian occupation? Um, how did the Italian occupiers behave towards the Jewish communities of Corfu and Rhodos? I don't, I don't know very well this situation. I, um, I, I think that uh, all the Jews um, of Rhodos were deported, 1,800. Uh, I, know, uh, uh, I, I know better the um, situation in uh, Thessaloniki, and it is very interesting because in Thessaloniki there, were a, there was a very a big community, Jewish community, almost 50,000, um, 48,000 uh, Jews, and there, there, uh, that were almost totally deported and exterminated. And the Italian uh, consul, uh, Guelfo Zamboni, managed to save uh, uh, some tens of Jews, not, uh, m not uh, many, uh, but it is interesting to know for which reasons, because in this case there, there weren't uh, the humanitarian reasons, but uh, the fascist government, because uh, Zamboni was the Italian consul during the fascist, the, um, fascist regime in the first month of 1943, uh, the f fascism, fascist regime uh, had, an, had an interest to have good relations with the com Jewish communities uh, in the Mediterranean towns like Thessaloniki, but also Alessandria d'Egitto, 
in order to achieve an influence in the Mediterranean. So most of these Jews were, uh, were very rich people, very powerful people, and there was a design by Mussolini to, to maintain good relation in order to have an influence, a political influence in the Mediterranean. And they so, had Italian passports. And they, had, they received Italian passports. Some, some, some of them have, have not uh, Italian passports, but received by the consul Zamboni an Italian passport and were saved. Yes. But the part of the Greek island where Italian... The, the pa part of the Greek island where Italian after the First World War. And there were no occupations, there were part of Italy. Like, like yeah, yeah. Like yes, but you were speaking... Ah, this, uh, of course... In, in Corfu, it was occupation in, in Rhodes. But they, I, in Corfu, they were deported after the Italian armistice. Before there was, the, so you are right, there wasn't part of the Dodecaneso, uh, so it was uh, Dodecaneso, the highland of the Dodecaneso, Rodi and the other, uh, um, not Corfu, Corfu is another, another, in, in another part of the Greek, uh, but the Dodecaneso was under the Italian uh, uh, domination rules, and so in this case, the, um, the Germans have uh, no uh, no possibility to, uh, to, to make uh, claims and to, de to demand the, the ending over of the Jews. Until 1947. Yeah, okay. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much. Uh, That's a vote. <laughs>